Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the corporate and partnership scrutiny meeting this morning. Um, I've just got to a lot of things popped up then for a moment. Um, firstly, I need to um, pull up this document. Um, members are asked, asked to accept the minutes and return a record of the meeting held on the 6th of December. Are members happy with this minutes as a correct record of the meeting? Everybody appears to be happy. Thank you very much. Melanie, uh, apologies for absence, please. Yes, we've received apologies from Councillor Bryn Griffiths, Councillor Richard Musgrave, Councillor Tony Randerson and Councillor Carl Les. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Councillor David Chance for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Melanie, public questions or statements? None received, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, the first item, uh, substantive item, is the uh, item number four, the annual workforce update from Justin, uh, I think Justin's there, I've seen her somewhere. Justine, there she is. Hello. Justine, um, it's a very comprehensive report. Thank you very much, and very full. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, instead of going through it line by line, could you pick out some key points in sections and then we go to some questions from members and then move on if that's all right with you? That's absolutely fine. I wasn't I wasn't person. I went through it line by line. We would be here a long time. So I yeah. will just flag set, flag areas that I think may be interesting, pertinent or important and then just just take questions afterwards. Yes. Yeah. And if you pause it after each section, that'd be great. And I'm sure members have read the report. So there'll be uh, a few questions coming your way. Right, over to you, Justine. OK, I, I have the report on um, my screen, so that means I won't be able to check hands up. So obviously relying on yourself, Chair, to, to, yep. to tell me, but I, I will um, I will um, pause periodically. So working through the report then, um, obviously it's been a year in terms of the workforce that has again been dominated by COVID. Um, I'll come on in a little while to talk about um, COVID-related absence that is, it obviously has significantly diminished, but at various points in the year, particularly the requirement to self-isolate from being um, pinged by test and trace was, um, was quite significant and did cause resourcing problems. We're now starting to see the long-term effect of COVID um, and, and some of that has played out throughout the year, but increasingly um, issues related to bereavement, long COVID and wider repercussions of the pandemic that apply to um, to um, the wider country, not just the county council's workforce, such as impact on mental health. So it, the other um, issues around COVID for the workforce have obviously been um, pressure on the workforce, particularly in um, HAS, and I'll come to that later. Overall, our county council workforce has, has over the last year changed not very much really. Slight reduction um, in terms of overall um, numbers and FTEs. Uh, there hasn't, as you would, ex there hasn't really been many restructures. You wouldn't expect that we've been dealing with COVID, but the 2020 restructures had almost played out and finished um, as we entered the year anyway. In terms of key workforce data, as I say, the composition, the gender split, um, ethnicity and disability hasn't really changed much. There's been a very slight change in year, though we recognise that some of our data, particularly on disability um, and ethnicity, is underreported because um, people, staff choose not to declare um, those categories. The age has reduced slightly to 47.3 years. Um, and our, our proportion of young people under the age of 25 has increased a little to almost 5%, not big changes. On sickness absence, our um, days lost uh, was low going into um, the year at 6.5 days lost for last year. It is looking like our outturn will be higher this year at around um, eight days or just over eight days. That is still 
low in comparison with similar benchmark councils who are looking at 12 to 16 days and in, indeed across kind of wider um, other employment sectors for large employers. So we have had, um, I've, I've detailed there the, um, the breakdown at 4.3 on the reasons for sickness absence. They, um, they haven't changed much during the year. Um, and COVID in terms of sickness and self-isolation actually now only accounts for 2% um, of absence and it was over 6% um, throughout the year. And indeed, we see that other infections and illnesses of, in terms of the impact on attendance are uh, resulted in larger absence than, um, than COVID is. We certainly saw as people started to return to their normal lives, a pickup in other infectious um, um, viruses um, and those having a greater impact on sickness absence levels, which, which I think was seen across the country. Moving on to 4.5 on health, employee health and well-being, we've continued our focus, as you would expect during the pandemic, on supporting staff with their health and well-being and supporting them to deal as positively as they can with living through the pandemic. And I won't, you know, there's a lot of support. It's detailed in the report at 4.5. I won't go through the detail of it. We simply expanded and improve the support that was available the previous year. I want to highlight turnover at 4.6. Our turnover um, for the County Council has never been more than 13% and it's always round about 11. It, it, it kind of pushed at 13 during austerity when we had a lot of restructures and um, la large numbers, you know, staff in there, hundreds and hundreds, were going through restructures and obviously quite anxious. You would expect turnover to go up then um, as people felt insecure um, in their role with the county council. But it, even then, it didn't go over 13%. We are now looking at a turnover of 16%, which is the highest level known and reported. There are a range of factors in that. Um, you'll all know how difficult it is to recruit. The job market locally is very tight and there have been a range of issues which have impacted on that. Um, so we are struggling in terms of retention and further on in the report, I will outline how we're also struggle, struggling in terms, of, um, in terms of recruitment. Another pertinent point on retention is our length of service um, is is nine years against a local authority average of seven, but that is reducing. And in terms of our retention issues, we are seeing people leave who have been with us a long time and are going for um, for other, other jobs. Um, we particularly seem to be under pressure in various technical and professional roles with them. Um, and, and we're not alone in that, but some of the uh, our district council colleagues would say the same with the new government departments opening, particularly in Darlington. The spend on agency pay, you would expect when we have recruitment and retention difficulties, has gone up um, and it is almost double what it was in the previous year. Um, some of that relates to IR35, um, but we are increasingly seeing a need for agency staff where we are struggling to recruit. That said, in some areas such as care work, we, we are struggling even to get agency staff um, in through the usual supply arrangements. That is a struggle. Um, so I'm just going to pause there now before I move on to recruitment developments and, and general recruitment and young people. Thank you very much, Justine. Uh, Mike Jordan, you're first. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> just a quick one, Justine. Um, what, can I ask what the up-to-date rules are on COVID and absence and, and everything in schools? Uh, I say this because this morning I got up and uh, um, our head teacher sent us an email to say nearly all his staff are off with COVID. I, I didn't think that. I mean, we've relaxed them at, um, at where I work now. Um, um, but there's they've got five out of um, uh, four of them are part time and one full time teacher. So all the part time staff are off and one full time off as of this morning, which is, as you can imagine, is causing him a lot of grief. I just wondered what the rules were. Uh, I'm a bit baffled. 
There are specific rules for schools, which I'm not that close to, but generally, whilst the legal requirement to self-isolate for testing positive has been removed by the government, and that was removed at the end of February, the government guidance is unchanged. So the government guidance says that if you if you um, test positive for COVID or you are a close contact, you should self-isolate for that, that usual period of time. Um, so that hasn't changed. That means particularly public sector employers like ourselves, um, we, our guidance for staff hasn't changed. The, my understanding is the government guidance will change at the end of this month and remove those um, remove those um, that guidance to self-isolate. So it's really relative to where we were last month, it's only the it's only the legal requirement to self-isolate. So you know people could be legally held to account if they didn't that's been removed. The guidance has the government guidance has not changed. Thank you for that. Supplementary Mike, are you done? I'm done. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got uh, Councillor Wilkinson and then Councillor Peacock, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Justin, for that um, in-depth report. Can I just refer back to 4.3, please? Um, it, it, you say here that over half of the absences are due to depression and stress and anxiety related. Has that increased because of the pandemic, please? Or was that a similar figure pre-pandemic? Yeah, it's half of the long term absences, so not all absences. And <laughs> um, it's it's increased slightly. Um, and we, you know, that might be in relation to um, mental stress due to the the impact of the pandemic. It might also be due to the fact that we are um, we're talking a lot more, been a lot more open about mental health, and there's a lot of initiatives going on to, to that. So it it may be that people are just more comfortable recording it in relation to stress, depression and mental health issues, whereas previously they weren't. And when we've, it, it's an interesting point. And when we've looked back at our data, the overall number hasn't changed in terms of um, uh, long term sickness absence, but some of the recording has. So, um, so, so we think that it's more likely that people are just more um, open about recording it as such. But it is certainly possible that there is a slight increase as a result of the impact of the pandemic. Thank you, Justin. It's, it's reassuring to see that all the groups that you do have, when you look on the council website, you know, all the support groups. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Peacock. Uh, yes, um, it's just on page nine when you refer to those in education, uh, working in education and, and your numbers is 47 percent in full time education. But for the fact that ac uh, academics, you know, sorry, the those are the ones that have um, made a difference. Uh, but what concerns me is, and I wonder if you've seen any of this, because of the last two years, we are our people coming in with degrees and things, are the training, are the teachers training, is there any problem of them actually getting qualifications to, to come out and teach in schools? Have you seen any of this? Because there's certainly when they haven't been in university, because they've been online, they haven't been able to go out and sort of start the training and I wonder if that is making any difference because that could be a real problem as we go in the future if we haven't got these coming out with the training um, teachers training ability to go straight into schools. Okay I, if it's all right I will pick up that point in terms of schools recruitment I've got a section on that so I can pick that up in relation to the the paragraph um, there in the reducing um, school um, workforce the issue there is that when schools convert to academies, we we are no longer we no longer have their workforce numbers. So it's not necessarily it it's not indicative of an overall reducing education workforce. Only an education workforce that the county council counts because if they're not maintained schools, we don't count them. Um, but I will come on to the issue of schools recruitment later on if that's okay. I must have missed that. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Trotter. Uh, good morning. Did you say, Justine, that uh, with the Darlington, with the government there, are they taking a lot of staff up there? Uh, what's the percentage really? Are they going to affect us in the long run there? 
Um, I, can't, I can't give you the percentage in terms of the um, how many staff we've lost. I can go and find out. I, ju I just I know that we have lost um, particularly in in um, in services like IT procurement, um, some some professional groupings like that um, uh, uh, project staff, project officers. I know that we have lost a number and I know that other local authorities, um, uh, notably um, Rydale, say the same. So um, that I know it's an issue, but I, I'm, I, can, I can collate such as we have the information and it's only when people are leaving if they tell us where they're going to via an exit interview. Um, but I'm happy to provide you with the um, the information that I've got after the um, the meeting, but I don't have, have it to hand and it would be limited by the fact that not everyone tells us where they're going. Yeah. With a lot of people from that area working county, haven't we? I suppose yes, we it's, it's, it's get a job on the doorstep, safe travelling and that. And I don't know about the money, whether it would be better money from the government than us, but it is uh, quite interesting now. We could be set us back quite a lot to this if this if they take a lot of our good staff. It would appear that the salaries are quite significantly more. I've had um, figures of, of uh, ten up to up to between ten and twenty thousand difference quoted at me. Right, worrying into. Mm, Thanks for that, Justine. Thank you. Um, there's no more questions. I've just got a couple, if that's all right. Uh, Two point one. Because uh, we talked about uh, the increase in sick days going to eight, um, and six percent of the staff with COVID. Uh, how does that compare with other authorities or other organisations of that similar size? Yeah, throughout the year we've kept um, we, we we've kept an eye on that in terms of benchmarking and other shire counties, other regional local authorities, and and it's been you know it's been broadly. Um, similar uh, and currently now as I say it only counts for two percent and I, I was on a meeting a regional meeting recently and other regional authorities Leeds, Rotherham, Doncaster, Wakefield were saying theirs was around two percent as well so they, it, it, we're not seeing anything any different to elsewhere. Cool and, and the other one is um, uh, 4.5 around support for the staff um, how are we making sure everybody knows the support's there and is available for them. We promote that a lot um, through um, the key messages, through direct emails to staff, um, through um, Richard's chief exec blog and his um, emails to staff. We talk about it on Yama, which is the um, county council's um, kind of social network for for staff. Um, so we do, you know, we do get quite a lot of interest. We do get quite a lot of use and um, we promote it like that. We also ask managers to cascade it. So we put it on team brief for managers to talk to all their teams about. Um, so I think, um, you know, I can't hand on heart say it reaches absolutely everybody all the time, but we but we do it across a range of communication channels and, um, you know, we, we and we, we constantly reiterate it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Councillor Jordan, you've got another question, please. Uh, just just a comment really to say welcome to my world as regards workforce and staff. Um, I passed the uh, prime old age of 70 last month and uh, I still work full time in the chemical industry. And one of the reasons for that is that the chemical industry is going through a restructure at the moment and every man and his dog is moving up to the northeast where there's been a massive increase in, in that part of the industry. So um, around Yorkshire, everybody's moving up to the northeast. Uh, it's it's just and, and the salaries are higher as well. It's just the way it is at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Justin, back to you. OK, so I think I got to um, section five on recruitment, um, which, as I said before, is, is kind of very pertinent and hugely um, important and difficult at the moment. So young people's employment um one of the initiatives, national initiatives during COVID um, in order to address unemployment levels for young people was um, Kickstart. Um, so you can see that I've detailed in the report that, um, that the, we, we have relatively low unemployment um, 
uh, compared to nationally. So our youth unemployment, young people under the age of 24, is 4%, is 6% nationally. But it did go up, ours did go up to 7.6% um, during COVID um, compared to what was 3% pre-pandemic. So things have improved um, significantly for young people in terms of their general employment opportunities. And there is now a buoyant employment market. But Kickstart was there in the midst of the pandemic to try to address what was what was con considered to be quite a difficult time for young people's employment. So you can see there, I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail of it, that the county council um, became a Kickstart provider and we actually became a, um, or a broker for other um, organisations who uh, were in the county area but were too small to have the resources to be a provider themselves. So we facilitated and supported 136 young people to get kickstart kick employment jobs um, and 120 of those were actually with different employers. We think that's gone really well and um, the feedback we get is that um, most of those um, if they don't stay in a job with their current organisation, they go on and get a substantive job elsewhere. So Kickstart was about giving young people um, an employment opportunity and support and obviously provided things like skills and confidence while they were um, undertaking their Kickstart placements. That was good. Um, traineeships, that was also a government initiative. We did a little with that, um, but not as much as we would have wanted and simply because um, there, 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 there wasn't the, um, we didn't have the, we don't have the type of roles um, that that scheme was really looking for. So we did, did, we did what we could with the type of roles that the County Council has. Then moving on to health and adult services, um, you will know, because it's all over the media, that it's a massive challenge nationally in terms of the number of vacancies. The number of vacancies detailed in North Yorkshire, this is across the care sector, um, says about 1,200 there. It has gone up further and we think it's it's um, it's at around 1,500 at the moment. It's difficult to get an accurate figure. We don't hold that information. So um, we are aware of the vacancies across the sector that we are supporting through Make Care Matters. And other than that, we are relying on other um, agents such as such as Skills for Care who collate the information to tell us um, what the vacancies uh, level is. So we've got our own Make Care Matters um, campaign and a, and a recruitment hub um, and that supports um, recruitment across the whole care sector. It was a really strong base going into the pandemic for us to support the wider care sector with both um, temporary and substantive staff. That it has, we we, um, we came into uh, later last year, knowing that it was becoming an increasing problem. Um, and across the sector, we were just struggling and the private sector was the same to recruit staff at all. So we launched a big uh, recruitment campaign that hopefully you will have seen. It included a TV campaign in the new year. And we, re we had a massive reach of over about half a million people, which we could tell from um, from all the hits that you get on the um, the site and the social media. And we, we worked with um, with a lot of providers to recruit to a lot of vacancies. I suppose it, it was a really successful campaign in terms of the exposure, um, but, and this is evidence of how difficult it is to recruit out there. To date, you know, we, we've, we've probably um, appointed about 200 from that um, campaign, which isn't, you know, given that it's been running since November, given the um, the exposure, it, that's not actually, it, it's, not, it's not really touching the sides in terms of the vacancies that are there. And the analogy I would use is that it's filling up a leaking bucket that is leaking quicker than we can fill it. So recruitment of care staff um, is a real um, a real problem to the extent that we actually asked um, county council staff in what we deemed to be non-critical service areas to um, during February go and work in um, our care homes in order to support um, our services and so some of those care staff in our services in our care homes could go and undertake um, a care work in people's homes where the 
the um, the sector um, couldn't provide the care and were were not taking packages of care that we needed to be delivered or were handing them back. So we did have um, quite a, a number of staff volunteered and we moved, we placed um, some 30 of them in our care homes across the county. And we recruited another 20, I think it's that's gone up slightly to 30, who said they were happy to undertake um, relief contracts, so to do additional care work um, in addition to their substantive role, which which um, would be in a different a different service. I've included at 5.12 some of the really um, heartwarming quotes from colleagues in other services that went in to, to undertake care work to support um, our elderly persons homes. Um, we've also continued to obviously recruit a range of other roles and we struggle again with some us with, with particular with roles such as social workers and occupational thera therapists. Well, the, I move on then to resourcing for education, which is at 5.1. We provide a specific level of support um, to schools on the coast, but we do have a wider offer to all schools. I make the point that um, schools are free to get support wherever they like or even or to do it themselves. Um, but we have a dedicated team that supports schools and they do a very good job. You can see there the number of vacancies that they've supported through the government established opportunity area on the coast. Um, they've dealt with nearly 400 vacancies and are filling 97% um, of them first time. Uh, and with big savings, obviously, in terms of not just advertising costs, but teaching supply. So we're not seeing the same level of, of difficulty in recruiting teachers, going back to the question that was previously asked, as we are in, in other um, areas, notably um, care and some of the, the other professional areas. It, it, is a, it is a challenge, but we are managing to meet that in supporting skills at the moment. Um, I'll move on to um, apprentices and then I'll pause. So apprentices, it's, this is the fourth full year of the apprentice levy scheme in operation. To remind you, it's, it's a 1% levy on payroll. That money is taken um, off us and put in a pot. Um, and then we basically claim back from that based on the number of apprentices that we have. A couple of years ago, there was the ability, if you, if an organisation wasn't spending its levy, to transfer that levy to another organisation that either wasn't a levy, didn't um, didn't have a large enough workforce to be a, to to have the um, the levy deducted from them, or had already spent theirs. And we've been um, we've been doing that in terms of levy transfer to good effect in order not to have in in essence money given back to the Treasury if the um, amount in the pot um, that's held isn't spent by a given point you have two years to spend it it is returned to the Treasury and obviously that's not something um, that we would want so there are details in the report about the number of apprentices about the type of apprentice roles that we're able to provide the fact that um, while some of the levy is returned to the Treasury, the vast majority of it um, is um, schools, um, spent contributions. Schools, in particularly small schools, have there are structural issues that make it difficult for them to, um, to take apprentices and use their levy, and I, I detail those in the report. During the pandemic, the government um, introduced an incentive payment for hiring new apprentices. So we did um, we did well out of that, and we and we supported schools to um, use it as well. And there are details are of five point two on those amounts. I detail at five point two one the issues, um, the structural what I refer to as structural issues with the um, the apprentice national apprentice scheme, which means that we could never meet what is deemed to be our public sector target. Um, for the reasons given, it 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 hasn't thus far um, been possible, and and I don't. I suppose I don't see a lot changing here and now. I do think, in terms of LGR and a new unitary council, there will be more opportunity to um, to um, fully spend the levy because of the um, the varied type of roles that will be available relative to the standards. You obviously can't have an apprentice if there isn't a standard. 
And for some of them, such as an apprentice social worker, some of those standards have been very slow in coming forward and therefore we haven't been able to take advantage of them. I've detailed in the report the key priorities um, going forward and I've detailed a bit about where we've used our levy transfer to good effect over um, um, various sectors, notably the care sector um, and uh, some of our wholly owned companies and also um, the construction industry, particularly aligned with the construction village in Scarborough. Um, so we, we, we're working hard at supporting local employers to have apprentices as well as us taking them ourselves. Um, the other point I would add there is that, um, that people often think that apprenticeships are um, and the use of the apprentice scheme is only for new starters and new staff. You can actually use it to upskill and qualify existing staff. So, for example, there is actually a teaching apprenticeship. Now, I mentioned there is a social work apprenticeship and we can use um, our, um, our levy for a range of um of professional qualifications, and we've de I've detailed there some of them. So we've got um, uh, we've got staff undertaking a chartered management apprenticeship via Coventry University. Um, we've got some staff in IT that are undertaking a professional IT apprenticeship, so they would have come into our um, IT service, our technology and change service, without um, a degree, and we're using the apprenticeship scheme to, to put them through one where they would carry on working and undertake um, usually a day a week at university. Um, so we, and you can see there the other higher level apprentice um, apprenticeships that we're using across accountancy, legal, et cetera. Um, graduates, we continue to do, um, to do well with um, graduate schemes that we operate our own graduate scheme and our retention levels are very high. You can see there we keep 84% of them. Um, over the last three years. We also recruit for district councils um, and we, um, we, um, we, we get young graduates in, we train them up and we support them while we're here. And I think that's why we retain so many. Um, we've also uh, 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 recruited an additional number to help us with the um, um, LGR work um, uh, and the various work streams from that, which I, th I think is a good use of the graduate scheme. Um, to to give young people an opportunity to get involved um, and to be able to um, to support the county council and thereafter hopefully go on to um, a substantive job. Graduates are appointed for um, two years into our specific scheme. So I'm going to pause there again. Thank you very much. Um, any questions for Justine, please? Councillor Jordan. Oh, Annabelle beat you. <laughs> Councillor Wilkinson first, please, and then uh, Councillor Peacock. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks again, Justine. Just to refer back to the Young People's um, Kickstart initiative and traineeships and things like that, are you finding that you're getting enough employers coming forward or is it still really challenging? Because I know we have lots of young people who'd like to do this, but it's not always easy to find the right employer, is it? Well, it was like that during the pandemic. It's actually the opposite now. So we have employers coming forward, but we can't get any kickstart applicants. We're really struggling to the point that it, they, the recruitment of kickstart goes through DWP and the young people that are that are um, that are not in work and um, are are um, are claiming benefits and um, that have struggled to get um, to get a job. So. DWP have particular criteria and they they then source the young people to match the um, the roles that are available. And what we found um, really in the last six months and certainly now is that we're just not getting the, the, the job centres aren't able to send us any. So business support, which is one of my areas, we we're very keen to to take kickstarts um, and we we had five across the county and, and we just didn't get anyone for them. Um, so it's so actually young people aren't going into kickstart now. I think that's because the, the jobs market is such that they can find um, better paid work that isn't a kickstart scheme, which, you know, is, is a good thing. Um, but it does mean that that we we are now struggling um, and as are other employers. So we do have employers coming forward to say, well, we'd like you to broker as a kickstart, but we, but we struggle to do that. Some of them are, are, are kind of easier than others, some that go into... Um, construction, for example, that go into 
um, particular um, uh, trades um, are easier to source than others. Right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peacock. Uh, yeah, I think, it, I think it's back to the schools and, and, and our young people coming back uh, from university and actually taking up in the small schools which, of course, they're not doing the same because they know they haven't, often, as you say, it's more part-time, they don't want them full-time. And then, on the other hand, it's the fact they can go to a bigger school and talk about the North East and, and now people travelling, uh, in actual fact, and get better pay, better opportunity. I think that's the point, to go up the ladder. And I, this is, concerns me because I think what we're ending up with is... is our, Maybe you'll tell me I'm wrong, but I feel we're ending up with our smaller schools having just older people, whereas back to wanting more younger teachers and so forth in our schools. Maybe I'm wrong, but I sense this to be happening. Um, Councillor Peacock, some of that information I don't have at my fingertips, but I will find out and, and get back to you in terms of the age profile in, in our smaller schools. Um, that that's where we have the data so obviously if schools are academies then we wouldn't have the data but for our maintained schools i can provide you with that uh, what i would say about school recruitment is it is challenging and it is more challenging for small schools than larger schools you're absolutely right there we work really hard at it and we have a dedicated quite large recruitment team that do nothing but supports um, schools, you know, they do all the social media work, they do all the, the, the LinkedIn, they um, they do campaigns, they create pools, they, con they, they link with um, students at universities and things like I mentioned, the teaching apprenticeship. So they also work with schools to, um, to, to, to uh, for teaching assistants to do an apprenticeship to be a teacher. So there are different routes. It is hard. Um, but currently, um, it's it's OK, um, is what I would say. But it is more difficult in small schools. And, and you're right, sometimes it is really, really challenging to build those gaps. But the age profile is a particular point, which I will I'll get back to you with that. And I'll get back to you with a, a, a bit more of a um, a bit more of a nuanced assessment of, of recruitment across the small schools. Thank you for that. Uh, just before we go to Councillor Ar Arnold, um, I'd just like to build on that because do you think the academy is attracting the younger staff um, or is there the, the no real demographic difference between which staff go where? I don't have any evidence that they that they are, um, and we do provide a lot of recruitment support for academies. They 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 use our recruit our schools recruitment team. So I, I don't get I don't pick up anything that they are attracting a different profile of teachers to um, to ourselves. Thank you, Councillor Arnold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just a quick question, um, Justine. I just wondered, um, the um, graduate scheme, have you got um, quite a few um, graduates wanting to take up that um, position? Because from what you said, working on the LGR, and um, there's quite a lot to, to do. So I just wondered what the uptake was. Thank you, Justine. Yes, I, that is one. Of, that is one of the areas that we do manage to recruit, to, which is good actually. And um, so, I, I think that's because um, across the county there aren't that, but you're particularly in our rural areas, there aren't that many graduate jobs that are actively recruiting no. graduates. And we we get lots of data, and the LEC would tell us that young, a lot of young people who who return from university they then leave again to get graduate jobs in more urban areas and in the cities where there is more choice. So um, so I think we do well because we, you know, we because there are lots of young people who um, who've got a degree who would like to stay. And what we're offering is um, is good jobs for them to stay and get some experience. So it's probably one of the only bright, bright spots in a very difficult recruitment landscape. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, if if you're ready to move on, Justine, please. OK, I am. I'm conscious of the time, so I'll try to whiz up, uh, uh, speed up a bit. So I'm now on 5.24 diversity and inclusion. And and there was um, it certainly when I came last year, we had a, a bit of a discussion about whether there was sufficient um, focus on this and sufficient activity. And I hope that you'd be reassured that 
um, that there is and that we've um, we've expanded the um, the employee networks quite a bit. They are still in the development, but but they are expanding and we are getting increasing um, membership and they are becoming increasingly um I suppose vocal, um, they attended our senior manager's seminar and um, talked very openly about some of the issues that, um, that their representative membership had. Um, and, that, and that was really, it was really powerful. It was really good to listen to that. And we're now responding. Um, and we've got those networks to work with on things um, such as our employment policies and how we approach things. We do quite a bit on celebrating diversity and inclusion. There's some details there. So I do think that we are making progress um, there. Uh, moving on to 5.27, engage in the workforce. Um, I've referenced here the um, staff survey. So we did a full staff survey um, this year um, and the details, I've pulled out some of the highlight details. We got a good response rate of 41%. I think then you, it, um, the kind of national average um, for surveys is around 30% is deemed to be a good result. So 41% was good and it was only slightly down um, on the last full survey we did in 2019, which predated the pandemic. So uh, you can see there that generally the satisfaction levels from a staff point of view, which I think is really reassuring, have actually gone up um, uh, uh, through throughout the pandemic. I, I think that is because we have worked really hard at engaging and communicating um, with our staff during the pandemic. They've they've had a lot a, a lot of um, communication and and engagement and access compared to previously. And indeed, some of those um, some of that increased access we will take forward post pandemic. So, for example, senior managers um, made sure that they did a lot of. Um, online open discussion sessions with um, with staff remotely, um, which which was you know for for most of us was quite new, and um, that meant staff who wouldn't normally be able to get to a, a face to face session were easily able to log on to an online session and felt that they you know felt more engaged as a result. So so I think that um, there's quite a lot we can take forward from the online communications that we did. Um, an engagement that we did during the pandemic. Um, and I think the results are reassuring. You will see at 5.3, we specifically asked staff who were working from home about their expectations and any anxieties or concerns that they had about returning to the office. And we, we're building on and addressing some of the um, issues that were mentioned there around not feeling confident, et cetera. But I, I've detailed how the staff survey is used. It's very transparent and staff and all managers can access all the data. Um, there was a particular engagement piece of work on new ways of working and that um, started during the autumn about engaging with staff about returning uh, any concerns or issues they had and what the returning would look like, what the new normal looks like, what hybrid working looks like, the fact that, you know, we we acknowledge that it's probably not going to return to how it was, but what have we lost from that and what have we gained from the new working arrangements and what should the future look like? And we very much placed um, our staff front and centre in those discussions and that teams have discussed with their staff what their working patterns would be. And there have been focus groups with lots of staff and, and via middle managers. Where we've got to on that is essentially a corporate framework that says staff are expected to return to face to face for certain things. And they are the other ones that you would expect their team meetings, their one to one supervision sessions, their appraisal sessions, their any their induction. And that's not just the person being inducted, but the colleagues they work with are expected to um, to be at work on a face to face basis when they've got a new colleague to help support them and introduce themselves, etc any um, meetings to do with the probation process for a, a new colleague, obviously any um, any staff issues, problems, welfare matters, um, performance matters would be dealt with on a face-to-face -face basis. And beyond that, we're, we're basically saying on a team-by-team -team basis, the team and the manager can determine what the future hybrid working looks like, but it fits within that corporate framework of what people need to do on a face-to-face -face basis. We also had the annual staff innovation awards that took place virtually that went very well. And I detail there at 5.34, 
um, the usual update on um, learning and development, which you would expect during a COVID year, the vast majority of it to have been online, but we did still have classroom training events that you could um, you would understand were needed, um, particularly for um, new house colleagues um, who were coming in and needed to have some face-to-face -face induction, some aspects of uh, care and support. Um, I'm not, you, I've detailed there at 5.36, the priorities coming up, I won't go through them. Um, and then moving on um, to the end of the report on um, pay and reward, I've just highlighted um, uh, how our, um, our pay changed during COVID. Um, that um, we did um, we did um, access furlough. You would expect travel spend on travel and other expenses to have been um, to have been reduced. Um, we introduced a whole range of short term um, changes in terms of weekend working um, and um, at standby hours, where we suddenly had hundreds of staff, particularly in or supporting house that were working weekends and undertaking standby. We had to make changes there. Um, the national pay negotiations have only just finished, um, but we had introduced the, we had applied the employer's offer um, in February and we've just got a notification late last week to apply the pay award. Um, so that's, um, that finally arrived almost a year late. And obviously there are now negotiations ongoing for, for the pay award for um, April coming up. Um, I think that's probably all I've got to say on pay. I mean, I've highlighted in, in reference to retention that um, you would expect um, pay and reward to come under pressure at times when um, there are difficulties retaining people. And, and we, I gave an illustrative example of the government department in um, in Darlington. And we at local authority, um, local authorities um, don't compare well with the NHS in terms of comparable posts for um, salaries either. So we need the national employers to um, not delay in terms of a pay award this year. Um, I've moved briefly on to LGR. I could talk about that for a long time. There is a work, HR workforce work stream, which I'm the sponsor of. It has a number of subgroups, um, which you can see there. Um, there is importantly a, um, a members working group, which I have detailed. Um, and in addition to that, the, the subgroups are all um, co-chaired and led by um, a member of um, my um, team and um, uh, at one of the district HR leads. Um, we are working really, really well together. It was wonderful to hear a district colleague say it feels like we've been working together closely for years. Um, we've got a great new combined team, which is good because we've got an awful lot to deliver for the 1st of April 23. There is a weekly operational group that brings together HR leads across all councils. And we're already sharing a lot of resources and support. So, for example, a lot of our train online training resources we now share with the with our district colleagues so that, so that their workforces can access them. We do joint recruitment campaigns where we've got shared posts, etc. And we have a <clears throat> we have a, a shared website where all our, all vacancies are put so that um, all staff can see them. So there's already a lot of of joint um, work and collaborative working, which is really good. I referenced the members working group, which is due to meet later for the first time later this month. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with them, the members detailed there. So um, that brings me to the conclusion. It has been another de demanding and um, unusual year dominated by COVID. It does feel like that is is now finally coming to an end. Um, we are focusing on um, on returning and hybrid working, what returning looks and feels like. We do need the government to drop the current um, guidelines in terms of um, what um, work bases need to look like and space, et cetera. Otherwise, we simply won't be able to fit everybody back in anyway. Um, we focused in year on the um, support to staff um, we've undertaken a survey to see how staff are and how they are feeling about us as an employer. And we've made a good, a strong start on all the LGR work. That's me done. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Councillor Jordan, you've got a question. Yeah, um, just a, just, um, do you do uh, one-to-ones with your, um, do, do the staff, you know, have a one-to-one -one with their immediate superior? Does, does, does that happen? Yes, it does. Um, right. It's, it's variously got different labels, either one-to-ones or supervision. Right. 
Um, so yes, it does. It does okay. happen. Usually monthly. Um, it yeah. may be more frequent in some services. Right. Okay. So because presumably you can get a lot of feedback from them. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the other thing, just just for clarification, the workforce meeting that you talked about, that's moved to the thirty first, hasn't it? From the twenty third. Yeah. That's fine. Great. Thank you, Chair. Made on. Thank you, uh, Councillor Trotter. Thank you. Uh, it's not all gloom and gloom, is it? I think what I hear from the report here today, I'm just going back my own personal involvement with it all. I'm getting so many inquiries about accommodation, agents ringing me up. Can you? I've got 10 girls coming, Filipina girls and boys coming, nurses trying to get hospital. I've got this coming from Poland. Uh, Spain uh, wanted. I don't know why everybody's jumping on the bandwagon to get agencies in, you know, looking at, at this job situation in England, thinking it's so bad. But there seems to be a lot of people wanted to come back now because everybody said they're all going back home. But it seems as if they wanted to come back now. What well, I can talking to friends of colleagues and that. The I immigration route. Sorry. Sorry. I was going to say the immigration rules have been changed. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, for example, um, you can now recruit care staff um, from abroad, and we yeah. are looking at that. But it is only for a twelve-month period, so yeah. there is yeah, there's a lot of work um, because if you're bringing people from abroad, obviously things like accommodation, travel, bank accounts, etc., they actually need a lot of support. We we work closely with our NHS colleagues who. Um, York Hospital, I think they, York and Scarborough, I think they bring over about 20 nurses from abroad every month. So they've yeah. got a very good template that we're looking at. So we are working with them and looking at whether or not we want to do the same across the sector for care staff. Um, but, but it's about understanding the level of support, like you mentioned, accommodation there that is needed. And if that's only for a year, it's it's not it's not a solution so we, it, it it would be good if that um changed on and up for an on, on an ongoing basis i thought i understand that i thought some of the contracts are three years for care it's just 12 months unless they they are at kind of more senior level but for, yeah. for basic care roles it's 12 months yeah but i mean i think i think you know we're seeing daylight a little bit because like the, uh, our councillor harrison was saying it was so bleak was care homes and all this and that, you know, about accommodation and staff and everything, you know. But it seems if the people from abroad are wanting to come to England, if we'll, if we'll give them passports, you know, the right certificates. It's certainly one, it's certainly one option in terms of filling gaps. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Andy. Uh, I, thanks, Justine. I've just got a couple of really quick ones, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, in the report, 5.3, um, we're saying 15% feel, uh, well, don't feel confident about coming back to work. Can you give us a bit of information around what we're doing to build their confidence back up and actually get them back in there? Because it, it must be difficult because you've had nearly two years of working from your home. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and there are a range of issues there. Um, some of it is just is is a real people having a real anxiety about COVID. And, and we're seeing that diminish now. So the survey was a few months ago and obviously um, the government restrictions have changed. So the guidance is still there. So I think as 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 people are able to go about their normal um, life, it, with less restriction they are starting to feel more com more comfortable we do however have a, a a number of staff who have a vulnerability to covid including yeah. some staff who for medical reasons haven't been able to have the vaccine so we are going to have to do risk assessments with those and identify to what extent we can change their working environment to reassure them and also to make it more safe so i think a few months ago there was a general anxiety about it and um and I think you're right, people find it, if they've been at home for two years, um, working from home, I found it really difficult. We've been encouraging people to start coming in for things like meetings, et cetera, yeah. freeing up um, larger meeting rooms. So I, I and we've been, um, we've been providing managers with lots of guidance and support in terms of supporting their staff. We've had the helpline running. So I'd like to think that figure has diminished, um, but we are saying really from April, 
when we hope the government guidance as it currently exists will have gone or been significantly diminished, we are expecting um, staff back. So I think a lot of staff will just have to take that first deep breath. And, and then we're rather hoping that a week or two in, people will be reassured and it will be OK. Brilliant. And and my last question is around uh, Tupi and the staff over. Uh, does everybody, well, are we making every effort to make sure they understand um, how and um, what Tupi actually means and how it works? Uh, we are. So we've got question and answers on that. We've got information on that. We've, we've provided, we've got an... We've got a, um, an intranet that's accessible to, to council staff across all eight councils that specifically answers questions on GP. For staff that wouldn't necessarily have easy access to the intranet, maybe in the waste depots, we're providing, we're doing, um, we're doing information sessions and providing the, um, that information in a printed form. Um, and then in, in the fullness of time, I'm trying to remember the time scale. I think it's from June. We will be doing face to face sessions with all district council workforce and talking to them about GP and, and talking them through it. So we're not there yet because it's a bit too early. There are things to do with GP that we need to have determined before we do that, such as. Will there be any changes that are termed measures? Because we would need to include and discuss those and consult on them. But we are intending from June throughout the summer um, and into the autumn to just do face to face sessions everywhere um, with all um, staff affected so that we, we can address all of their concerns and issues. But TUP essentially is about protecting people's terms and conditions and employment service and employment rights. Um, and that's really the message that we need to get over. If I was anxious about anything to do, to do with LGR from a workforce point of view, it would actually be about people feeling worried and leaving and getting another job. I think, you know, we, we need all those um, skilled and experienced staff that we've got to transfer over. So we really do need to major on reassurance. And that's both written information, online information and face to face. Yeah, no, that that's great because uh, I mean I think some people still don't understand Tupi in uh, their jobs over and their roles, and uh, I think we are losing staff because of that, um, just for security reasons. You know, I mean, because there is jobs out there, like you say, the job market's pretty buoyant, so why not look for a job that you know is going to be still there in in the future? Um, yeah, and I, I think that I mean they're the messages that we're trying to be very clear to say. You know, GP protects you to move over. There no doubt will be changes when you've moved over, but that will be done in a planned and considered way. And with a turnover level across the new council, even if it's less than we've got now, we would be able to manage um, the vast majority of any staffing changes by vacancy management so that people should feel reassured that they will have a job going, out, going forward and want to move over. Like I said, the biggest risk is actually people leaving and, been, and that that been a problem for the new council. Thank you very much. Councillor Jordan. Yeah, sorry to just come back on that one, Justin. Um, it is going to be a brand new council, as um, as Richard Flinton has said. So do the not, I presume then that the North Yorkshire County Council staff will also be two paid across. It, no, they won't. There is a distinctive difference there on a continuing authority model. They will just kind of move over. It doesn't. It gives. It gives no one group, be it district or county, any more protection. Or it's just you don't. You don't have to. Um, you don't have to physically apply GP in the same way that they just move on a continuing authority model. They just move. They just transfer oh, okay. without GP. But as I say, it doesn't. Practically, the only difference it makes is you don't have to do GP consultation. Right. Okay. Thank you. So just for clarification, it's district staff that will be stupid, not county council staff. It is. County council staff on a continuing authority model will just transfer over. District staff will be stupid in. Yep. But as I say, in reality, it, 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 there's no difference in the level of protection. Um, it, it's just you don't have to you don't have to do the, the kind of specific stupid application for the county staff. Lovely. Thank you very much for that. I can't see any more hands, so I, it just uh, for me to thank you, Justine, for your very great <laughs> hard work on the report, because it's a very uh, substantial report. Um, and uh, we'll see you again 
later in the year, I think. Is Melanie? Is it later this year or or next? We normally get an annual update. So um, yeah, it'll be programmed into the work program, and and the new committee following May and the elections will 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 de- look at the work program and make decisions on that basis. Brilliant. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Uh, right. Uh, item five: Corporate Volunteering Project Update from Keeley with ably assisted by Adele. Or maybe the other way around. Maybe I got that wrong. <laughs> Am I going to get told off by Adele? No, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a double act on this, if that's OK. But uh, I'm aware of the time, so I will very, very quickly run through the report. Um, and, and as you've already rightly said, the, the purpose of this is to provide scrutiny members with an update on the corporate volunteering project. So in, by way of a little bit of a background, a bit of a reminder, um, this was approved by the 2020 programme. Uh, The project is sponsored by Stronger Communities and delivered by the Resourcing Solutions team, and it aims to maximise and optimise the involvement of volunteers across all county council services. Uh, We're trying to achieve this uh, by creating a positive and consistent volunteer experience and journey, and progress is overseen and coordinated by a volunteer subgroup, and that comprises representatives from Stronger Communities, from the Resourcing Solutions team, as well as lead officers from all volunteer-involving services across the council. As you can see in the report, there was a significant impact on NYCC volunteer-involving services during covid Some were halted and some were significantly reduced, particularly through the varying levels of restrictions that we've seen over the last two years. And this is illustrated through the volunteering levels table that's outlined in section 3.2. However, that comes with the caveat that, you know, some of the information that Justine's just mentioned around academisation of schools and some of the school governors have also transferred over to the academy. So they're just no longer classified as NYCC volunteers. But equally, we we need to acknowledge that some volunteers have felt nervous um, about returning to community facing services. And, you know, we continue to support those or those um, services with continuing the retention of volunteers. Um, As we took tentative steps towards recovery in late 2021, um, an online survey was issued to all NYCC volunteers to which we received 80 responses. And I think you'll agree it's a very, very positive uh, response that we've had, which is outlined in section 3.2. Um, some key highlights, 84% of respondents are satisfied with their role. The most common reason for getting involvement is wanting to keep active, but closely followed by wanting to help their local community. More than 90% of respondents agreed the expectations of them were reasonable. The support level is very good and they had a good awareness of how to raise any issues or challenges. And 80% of them don't want any recognition, uh, with around a fifth of them saying a social event or a verbal written thanks would be most appropriate. That said, we do recognise that feeling valued and that recognition is really, really important and is a key part of the volunteer experience. So the survey, um, in addition to be a really positive story, is going to be a great benchmark as we approach LGR and has provided insight information on the volunteering experience and and how we work together to shape our future offer. So other key areas of work uh, include the development of the online application form as part of the broader digital volunteer journey. Um, The form was trialled in 2020 and is now in place for services wishing to recruit new volunteers. Um, I think it's quite clear from the report that there are a great deal of syn- there's a great deal of synergy between the employment and the volunteer journey. And as such, that application form is linked to the corporate recruitment system and that will hopefully enable swift and efficient processing and provides a really consistent and cohesive approach for all services. And um, the broader digital volunteer journey that I've just mentioned also continues to make progress. Uh, We currently have a project brief that is with technology and change to create the infrastructure um, to enable volunteers to apply, complete the application process, do their induction, record their hours, claim expenses, etc. Or be able to do all of that digitally. And of course, there will be uh, provision made for those who still prefer alternative approaches. 
Um, as you see in the report in 2021, we had a series of volunteer celebration thank you events, uh, which took place across the county in conjunction with our community support organisations, which encompassed both pandemic response volunteers and N NYCC volunteers as well. Although some had to sadly be cancelled due to the rise in COVID levels uh, or they were postponed, those that took place were really positively received. So in terms of our future focus, uh, as we look towards LGR, we're going to be working very closely with our district and borough council colleagues to move forward and create that consistent volunteer approach. We're going to be looking at our supported volunteer project, uh, which was being scoped by the Stronger Communities programme prior to COVID. So we'll be picking that back up uh, and looking at those who may need additional support to access volunteering uh, opportunities. And finally, we need to continue to work with our invaluable Team North Yorkshire volunteers as well, who have worked with us throughout the pand pandemic response and will continue to be crucial as we go through recovery. So all of the above will be recognised and obviously a light shone on our NYCC volunteers during this year's Volunteers Week. So that's a really quick run through the report um, and it was just recommended that members note the progress. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Keely, did you have anything to add? No, I think Adele covered <laughs> everything there. Um, I just add that that we were really pleased with the results that came back in from the volunteer survey, and there were some quotes on there about how um, some of the volunteers personally put how much they enjoy it and they like staying active. So um, I think Adele's covered everything. Brilliant, uh, Councillor Peacock. Uh, yes, it's um, I'm, I'm involved in the Upperdale's Community Partnership, which of course you know has the volunteers, and I'm just thinking that. And I've looked at the figures and, you know, they were high during the COVID because there's no question everybody wanted to help. But I, I think one of the problems we've had is that the library was closed. You know, there was people we were trying to recruit just for the library itself. Well, of course, during because of COVID, you know, there was nobody, uh, you know, it was closed more often than it was open. And, and, and I think that's now, it's now starting to open up that we're going to have to do more work locally i'm not meaning yourselves as much but ourselves locally because with the library being closed for that long and i think some of these things may be happening also across the the county i just thought i'd put that in thank you councillor peacock um I'm sorry i've just switched screens uh oh we've got some more uh keely or adele wanted to come back in who wants to go first Keely, you go ahead. Yeah, just in response to um, Councillor Peacock Chair, um, I believe the libraries, the NYCC libraries, are about to go out with a volunteer recruitment campaign because we're supporting them with it. So that will not just be to recruit um, recruit volunteers to the NYCC Core 5 libraries, but also um, acknowledge the, the benefits of volunteering in your local libraries, your local community libraries. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Adele, do you still want to come in or? Thanks, Chair. Yes, please. Um, yeah, it was just to, to sort of reinforce Keely's message there that um, obviously stronger communities are involved with, with all of the community libraries as well um, and have been for the last five years. And I think you're absolutely right, Councillor Peacock. I think because of we've had this intermittent starting and stopping of services, it has been incredibly difficult to keep people engaged. But we will continue to work with each of those individual libraries um, and support them with their with their volunteer recruitment. Um, so it's just to reassure you, we're still there and we're still doing that work with them. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. I've just got one question. It was at uh, 4.1 where, where you've done some research into uh, districts that actually engage with volunteers. Is there, is there many districts that don't engage with the volunteers? Or are they in the minority? If I could come in, Chair. Ah, yes, with pleasure, Keely. Um, I think the main two district councils that definitely have volunteers and volunteers in like a significant area are Scarborough Borough Council and Skipton Council. We are, we've got links, named links in those councils that we're 
current I've got two um, colleagues who are going to be having conversations with them about the nature of the work the volunteers do how they recruit how they coordinate and the volume so I'd say it's mainly those two um, a couple of the other councils have said well we ad hoc have volunteers but it seems to be a, a lot more casual um, basis and not as much structure around it so we'll need to look at um, either bringing them online in terms of the, the, the approach that we have at North Yorkshire so that that it's a bit more structured data management etc um, or um, decide whether they're actually more arm's length volunteers because we acknowledge that some some volunteers aren't really part structural of the council but the council might I don't know provide them litter pickers or something um, so that's where we're at with at the moment it's certainly something we'll be able to provide an update in our next overview and scrutiny update because we'll be a lot further along then thank, thank you uh, just before I go to Councillor Jordan I mean do you think um, LGR will help bring it all under one umbrella and and consolidate it all so that it actually works better instead of everybody doing their own little bit in silos? Yes, I absolutely think it will. And I think the volunteer journey that we've commissioned with technology and change will be a key part of that. And LGR almost gives us the vehicle to um, to move that along further so that we've got um, a consistent volunteer process. I mean, it works well in itself and it's, as you said, and acknowledged in its silos. But when we, for example, need a lot of volunteers COVID's a perfect example. We have to go out via the coordinators to get the requests in, whereas to have them all under one portal and, and be able to send out a direct message to our volunteers to appeal for information or help about something will be much more beneficial. And we'll have a wider pool of volunteers when we bring them all together for the new council. Thank you very much. Councillor Jordan. Thanks for that. Yeah, one of the, I mean, uh, we uh, I'm in three groups um, um, in a, a role at Selby District, and we tend to try and keep ourselves to ourselves in in in, in terms of um, liaising with the council. Because as a classic example, I, when I was councillor at uh, Sherbourne and Elmet uh, for at North Yorkshire, um, we decided we wanted to set up a group to do the flower beds and uh, and work around some land that belonged to the council near the boots and uh, we were just getting grief all the time in terms of what we could do and what we couldn't do so we took the attitude okay we'll leave it and so we we, we'd, we didn't bother with the council anymore and just got on with it um and and did all the cleaning up and and the council have never bothered us um and and we found that that is the best way to work i'm afraid Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Um, any more questions, please? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the report. And I uh, hope to see you um, after the elections. Uh, take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. All right, I'll just nip back to my other document. Uh, ah, Simon. Update on council plan refresh. Good, good morning. Uh, yes, yeah, thanks. Um, thanks. Are you on your own? Um, I'm. I'm not. I'm, uh, Elaine has joined me. Oh, there's um, Elaine. She'll do the bulk of the talk, and I'll just quickly introduce it, if I may. Yep. Okay. Um, so when we came to this meeting in December. Um, we, we talked about um, a light refresh of the council plan for the next year. Um, and, and the reason for the light refresh is because, you know, the, 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 the core business of the council remains the same and therefore the bulk of the council plan remains the same. But I just wanted to emphasise that the, the, the changes that have been made, the additions that have been made that Elaine will quickly talk you through, really reflect growing ambitions uh, an increased focus on certain areas. So although they are additions, and it might be the odd word here, the odd sentence there, and indeed, you know, objectives, et cetera, and principles added, um, the, the, it is actually involving an awful lot more work and bringing on the ambition of the council a lot more. So I just wanted to make the point that, you know, a light refresh really doesn't justify, you know, the, the, the where we are. And if I can hand over to Elena, she'll, she'll talk through those um, like refreshes. Good morning. Good morning, Elena. Good morning. Over to you. 
Okay, so the main changes that have been refreshed for the council plan is there's been a new section added on LGR. Um, this sets out how we work together with the other councils to deliver LGR and how there's been a number of work being set up to deliver the new council. There's also, for the ambition leading for North Yorkshire, there's been additional outcome added, which is to work with the district and borough councils and to deliver local government reorganisation and provide strong foundations for the new council. For this ambition, there's also been a few additional priorities. So these include delivering our carbon reduction goals through the Beyond Carbon programme. And also a priority has been added on the Rural Task Force, which will support and monitor the implementation of the Royal Commission recommendations. Um, for the ambition, every adult has a longer, healthier and independent life. There's been two additional outcomes added. These include people can access presentative services, technology and supported housing, which helps them to live more independent lives. Another outcome that's been added is supporting and developing care providers and working with the NHS across the county to ensure people have the services they need. For this ambition, there's also been a few additional priorities added, which include providing, protecting the health of North Yorkshire residents and reducing inequalities. Under the ambition, strong economy and commitment to sustainable growth, there's been additional outcome of supporting and support and deliver major transport and regeneration projects across the county, as well as having some additional priorities added, which include pursuing devolution for North Yorkshire and York, improving east-west connectivity, working in partnership with York and North Yorkshire Growth Hub, the expansion of the rollout plans for free Wi-Fi in town centres, as well as section being added on the bus service improvement plan. Under the Ambition, Innovative and Forward Thinking Council, there's been additional priority, which includes ensuring we create the best possible conditions for the new Unitary Authority in 2023. And there has been no major changes to the Ambition, every child has the best possible start in life because these have mainly been rolled over. That's all the main changes that have been added to this year's plan. Is there any questions? Uh, happy to open this up to questions, members. I mean, most of those were key points, but I, I can imagine there's a substantial amount of work gone behind each one of those. They're, they're just not little uh, the bullet points, aren't they? They're not really telling us how much work's gone into them. So, uh, but we don't seem to have any questions. So everybody, see, oh, if Councillor Peacock. I always seem to come in, sorry. Um, no, it's no. just the, uh, the Rural Task Force. I mean, I'm presume you're referring to the, the the commission that was done and trying to follow some of those points is that what it actually is because you know sometimes it was very important when it was set up and then we got the report and then all of a sudden LGR turned up and and, and I know what part of that of course as I'm always very heavily in, interested in was um, housing and there was some very very strong strong elements there on housing which of course but in April 2023, the unitary will be in charge of housing, whereas at the moment it's district. Now, in an area like the National Parks, which of course covers right over to Craven, etc., the local plan is going through at the moment um, on housing of the Yorkshire Dales National Park. You know, it is very, very important that, you know, if we are putting something like this forward in our local plan, that we're actually making sure that it hasn't been put on the side and not been making some representations into that local plan. You know, I'm a very aware of how much work officers are doing. So I, I, I'm just putting something in there, probably meaningless, but I put it in. If I could come back on that, please, uh, Chair, just, just please to make the points. And it's, and it's really to emphasise your point that, you know, Elena talked through the objectives or the outcomes which is literally a sentence underneath is the detail. So that the, the thing about the Rural Task Force, Councillor Peacock, absolutely is what was the Rural Commission, which was an independent group of um, experts who were brought together. They've made their recommendations, and now the Rural Task Force is a group of um, officers and partners who are taking forward those recommendations. So there was there was getting close to 60-odd recommendations, of which almost half were actions for the county council. 
So really the Rural Task Force is about acting on those um, um, recommendations and making progress. But you're absolutely right in that also that links in neatly to the ambitions around setting the best possible conditions for, for LGR, where the opportunities to do more on things like uh, housing uh, under a unitary authority uh, are, you know, there's, there's in, uh, in further opportunities. So, so yeah, the, there is more detail in the council plan, but it is it's picking up the recommendations of the Royal Commission. The commission as such have ceased meeting because they've made their recommendations and it's now over to us to do, to do something about it, basically. Thank you very much. Um, I've just got one around transport and uh, the uh, east-west connectivity. Are we looking at other schemes besides uh, what Transport for the North are looking at, which is basically the M62 corridor? Because uh, I think we need to look at other areas to connect the east and west, uh, not just through the M62. Um, yes, thank you. Um... You'll, you'll know from the, the LGR business case, east-west connectivity within the council um, was, was a strong part of it. And quite often when we talk about east-west connectivity, we end up talking about rail from, say, Leeds to Hull, which just touches the, 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 you know, the bottom of the, of the, of the uh, county. So as, as Councillor Jordan has just said in, 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 the, in, the, in the chat, it, 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 uh, it says the ambitions around the A64 and other uh, east-west connectivity, very much dependent on uh, acknowledging it is an issue and therefore trying to source the large funding streams that will be required to make some major um, improvements to the A64 and uh, other east-west connectivity. Lovely. I think that also involves, you know, linking in um, to, say, um, uh, things like North Allerton as a train station, which, again, is north-south connectivity, but getting to the train station in the first place is an east-west connectivity issue. So it's, it's that sort of uh, wider issue. Thank you very much. Um, I can't see any more hands, so uh, thank you very much, Simon and Elena. Um, and, and we'll see you later in the year. OK, thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much. Take care. Um, uh, the work programme. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> well, they could reopen Spofford Station if they wanted to. <laughs> But we'll leave that one there if that's all right. I was only being facetious. Uh, Melanie, work programme. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, members have had a chance to look at the draft work programme that's uh, been part of the agenda pack. Um, obviously, there are a number of items showing for the first meeting in the new municipal year, which is uh, our June meeting. And obviously, at that point, because we're likely to have had a change in membership, it will be up to the new committee to then go ahead and um, make changes, amend, add to the work programme moving forward for the rest of the year. Uh, I'm not aware of any out other items to add to June at this stage and would be well would welcome ideas from members if they felt that it is quite a heavy agenda, as you can see. And there are some um, big items on there. So um, members may decide that what we have there is sufficient really for that first meeting. Thank you very much, Melanie. Um, Councillor Jordan's got his hand up, but just before we go to Councillor Jordan, uh, I'd just like to, uh, no, no, we'll go to Councillor Jordan, go on. Are you sure, Chair? Go for it, because I forgot what <laughs> I was going to say. No, I just, I just <laughs> wondered. <laughs> I just wondered if we had any, um, or uh, it was worth us looking at what's happened with Welcome to Yorkshire and what the hell we're going to do going forward. But I've been told no, so okay then, no boss. All right. We'll leave that one for the um, the new committee, if that's all right. Councilor yeah, yeah, oh, yeah I, I, I don't disagree, but I just think it needs mentioning. Um, the, there is many things um, in the work programme that come every year. So to um, until the committee gets its feet under the table, we'll probably leave the programme as is, unless there's something really urgent somebody would like to see on there. I'm getting 
No other questions. So there's nothing to add. But if there is anything, please email me and uh, Melanie and we'll see what we can do. Right, we've got one more item, I believe, if I can find my... Uh, oh, AOB. Um, there's none that I'm aware of. No other business. Um, I've lost an item, Melanie. Chair, the last item on the agenda is the um, exempt minute from the last formal meeting of the committee. Obviously, if members wish to discuss in detail anything within there, we would need to go into private session. But if it's just a case of members agreeing that they're happy to um, accept that draft minute as a correct record of that particular item, then we can do that in, in you know, we can do that and it, it can be part of the broadcast. Yeah. Um, members feeling on that? Are we happy to just note the uh, the item? I've got a thumbs up. Val? Val's happy. Uh, everybody's happy. We'll just note that one, Melanie, if that's all right. Everybody's in agreement. Thank you. And the last item is, when I can find it, any other business agreed with the chair? I've nothing and nothing urgent. So um, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending and um, good luck with the elections and I'll see you in May, hopefully. <laughs>